I'm Lisa Senecal. And I'm Maya May, and We're Speaking starts now. Hey, everyone. Hello. Hey, Lisa. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to We're Speaking. We are here. We are here and we are yellow. We're yes. Very... <laughs> Optimistic. It's, yes. We've decided that in order to talk about some of the complicated and complex issues that are plaguing uh, not just our country, but the world, it is important that we uh, demonstrate optimism. And so we are doing that with our color palette today. That's right. Any little way that we can find to kind of lift ourselves up, create yes. more energy, gird ourselves for the work ahead. Um, we're finding ways to do that that apparently involves cupcakes and yellow and all sorts of other. Yes, we have to things. create our joy uh, because there are bad actors out there who are trying to take yeah. it away. Um, looking at you, Russia, uh, on a on border that you shouldn't be. And so uh, we are very much today talking about the use of disinformation, the weaponization of uh, language, of propaganda, and far-right extremism. Right. We have to keep talking about this because it's in talking about it that we educate ourselves and we really need to all fully understand what it is that's going on uh, what the far right is doing so we can recognize it, mm -hmm. we can help our kids recognize it. Right. And, um, you know, all of that is going to be necessary for us to be able to make sure we continue living in a democracy. Yeah. And the patterns are there. That's what's very important to notice, because what's happening here, what's happening abroad, uh, it all follows a, a formula. And so once we understand that formula, um, we can kind of learn how to dismantle it. And that was part of what media literacy used to be. Uh, me media literacy was something that was once taught. And so people had a really good ability to be able to discern what was true um, from what was false. And unfortunately, now, um, Places like Russia, which have kind of pioneered this, um, have gotten really, 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 really good at it across the board. Um, it looks like fine marketing now. It's almost like they had Leo Burnett do their uh, branding and advertising for them. And so uh, we're, we're going to talk about that with our guest tonight. But before we get to our guest, guest Cynthia Miller Idris, who is a absolute expert in this, she's the director of Peril, um, we need to talk about the Putin created crisis in Ukraine. Um, yeah, it's, it's on everybody's minds, of course. And it's not just because we, as Americans, respect Ukraine's boundaries and borders, um, but we really care about the Ukrainian people. And also this Russian aggression, we can't separate what Russia is doing um, on uh, surrounding the borders of Ukraine from what Russia has been doing attempting to mess in our elections, but having a consistent campaign um, of disinformation aggression in the United States. Yeah, as we'll be discussing disinformation and far-right extremism tonight, we wanted to roll the Lincoln Project's latest ad. It really brings it home. It was just released today. Um, and if you think it shows the stakes as much as we do, please, please share it uh, far and wide. Or just send that link out. Uh, please have a look. It is so striking to see how figures like Tucker Carlson and others on Fox are rooting for Putin. Vladimir Putin does not want Belgium. He just wants to keep his Western borders secure. That's why he doesn't want Ukraine to join NATO. And that makes sense. Fox host unabashedly makes Putin's case. Imagine how we would feel if Mexico and Canada became satellites of China. Right-wing agitators spewing Russian propaganda into millions of American homes. Why do I why care, care what's going on in the conflict between Ukraine and Russia? Be because, and I'm serious. Because, like, why do I care? I'll tell you why. And why shouldn't I root for Russia? Because, which I am. Because Newsmax ran a cover story titled, Vlad the Great. Russia, 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 Russia is bad. Russia, Russia, Russia. Russia, if you're listening, I think in terms of leadership, He's getting an A. Certainly a respected leader. He's respected in his country. I think Putin's been a very strong leader for Russia. The truth is that he is uh, strong and he's tough. Putin says very nice things about me. I think that's very nice. He just said it's not Russia. 
I will say this, I don't see any reason why it would be. The visiting Republicans not only didn't pressure the Russian government about them monkey-wrenching our election, they also didn't really pressure them about anything else either. So you're a Russian agent. I mean, I, let's not even engage in that because it's so outrageous. As you used to say when we were kids growing up in the United States, what's good for the lightly populated Russian colony of Ukraine is good for us. It's his defense of Russia's threat against Ukraine, the Kremlin-backed channel. Now wants to highlight. Excellent performance. It's like a partnership made in autocratic heaven there. Yeah, it's it's so incredibly disturbing. I mean that we have come so far from recognizing uh Russia run by Putin, who is a criminal, and he is a king of misinformation and disinformation, that that we now have people who have so much influence, like Tucker Carlson, out there, not the just defending, like full on promoting, yeah. like, hey, Russia, we should be backing them against our democratic ally, Ukraine. It's a very, very, very confusing uh, place to be in, but it just shows exactly how effective they are with their messaging. And in order for us to be effective, we have to have a better understanding of just what they're doing, how they're doing it, how they're radicalizing people, where it starts. And so that's why we are so glad to have Cynthia Miller Idris back on our show. Um, yeah. she, is, she runs the Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab, which stands for PERIL, which is, I love, I love a good acronym, yep. <laughs> uh, at the American University. And she's an expert in far-right extremism, far-right movements, and youth radicalization. So we are going to talk to her today amid a growing sense of urgency, uh, because between Russians' rampant disinformation campaign, which is radicalizing people here in the U.S. and Canada, it's uh, and also presenting an imminent threat to Ukraine. So, so we will welcome Cynthia, Cynthia Miller Idris. Thank you, show. Cynthia, so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Good to be back. Yeah, we were we were thrilled to have you the first time. Yes, even more so now. Um, the the work that you do is mm -hmm. so incredibly important, and um, you are out there in so many different places. Maya and I try to catch you um, wherever yeah. you're you're giving talks as frequently uh, as we can. Um, you were just speaking at your alma mater, Cornell, and that was a, a phenomenal talk. Um, so we're so excited to have you here talking with us today. Thanks. Um, you know, right, right after the insurrection, you penned an article in the Boston Globe titled Capital Attack was an epiphany for the far right. It better be one for the rest of us, too. Has it been? It hasn't been as much as I would like it to be. Um, mm -hmm. I think it has been an epiphany or a wake up call for a lot of people. I think it ha I think it was for the Biden administration who produced the first ever national strategy on combating domestic terrorism. I think we've seen kind of national threat assessments in the U.S. and around the world and in other countries recognize this threat. But we also have real partisan divides about what January 6 was, what it represented. I keep hearing people call it the culmination of something, which I think is a mistake, um, instead of seeing it as, as one more step toward an ongoing threat to democracy that we have. Um, that really comes in part because of people's tremendous vulnerability to disinformation and willingness to believe propaganda. Yeah. And going along with that, one of the reasons we wanted to chat is because I was having a conversation with you offline about this perception about the people at January 6th, because, we, you know, you mentioned January 6th is being used to recruit new people. Um, but the idea what kind of people they're recruiting, because everybody seems to think it's the disenfranchised, the people who have lost their voice in America and are now just trying to get that voice back. Um, but that's not quite the case, you said. Yeah, we often hear this mistaken language, both about disenfranchisement and also economic insecurity. So people will talk about those two things. But what we find actually is that the most vulnerable people economically, the most disenfranchised, obviously, 
um, as we know from the fact that we did have very small numbers of unemployed people, for example, uh, storming the Capitol. You know, the most disenfranchised people are not the ones who are at risk. Um, there's really interesting research in a study in Germany that showed that actually people are not at greater risk of joining the far right if they are unemployed, but they are at greater risk if they grew up in a household with an unemployed parent. So it's really that emotional experience of precariousness that I think is most important. And one of the ways we see that playing out when it comes to vulnerability to propaganda is in susceptibility to rhetoric or disinformation or propaganda that tells people something is going to be stolen from them. And so we see that again and again with Second Amendment rights. We see it with white supremacists saying a white country is going to be stolen from you or taken away by immigrants. And we saw it with the election, this idea of a stolen election. So people who feel vulnerable because they maybe have experienced, as we know, on January 6th, there were a high number of people who had a bankruptcy or a tax lien or a or a um, eviction in their in their history, even though right now they're not actually economically vulnerable. They have experienced it in the past, sometimes all the way back to childhood in ways that create emotional receptiveness and vulnerability to some of that disinformation. So I think understanding that notion of precariousness as an emotional state is a really important to distinguish from actual disenfranchisement. There's an element of privilege in there too, right? Because mm -hmm. If the people who were really um, most susceptible to being radicalized were people who've experienced economic insecurity, we would be talking about black and brown people in our That's country. Right. <laughs> and it's it's not just privilege, it's entitlement, right? right. So mm -hmm. there's, I think it's privilege plus entitlement. It's a sense that you deserve something. So you're feeling precarious, but you're also feeling like you're entitled to the thing that's going to be stolen from you. And so, you know, why do we have, why, why are people expressing a sense of entitlement about a white majority country? They believe that there's an entitlement to it, that there's some kind of racial entitlement to the land. And we saw that all the way back to to you know, blood and soil under the Nazis. And we see it in eco-fascism today, which is this kind of intertwining of the environment and white supremacy. So all of these things really rest on the idea of entitlement, but it mixes with things like a sense of precariousness to create that toxic mix of vulnerability to the propaganda. And I definitely wanna talk about eco-fascism. Uh, later in the show, because the first time I heard it was from you. And I was like, oh, this is a term I have never heard before. Um, but this emotional piece um, is so interesting to me because it is driven by emotion. And we have the people who are receptive to it, but we have the people who are taking advantage of it. And I'm so interested in your thoughts on not just the Tucker Carlson's of the world, but you know, Lisa and I were talking about this whole patriotic education and Charlie Kirk's organization where they're trying to develop a curriculum um, that's going to instill a sense of entitlement. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think we see both that kind of instilling or, or, or claiming of an idea of patriotism and also a, a twisting of it. So we see that a lot in the recruitment of both on the white supremacist extremist side, but especially on the unlawful militia side and the anti-government extremism side, where you have tremendous recruitment of veterans happening and active duty military and active duty law enforcement. And the rhetoric and propaganda there leans into the idea of defense of the nation, of protection, of um, protecting the constitution or of being heroic. And so one of the things we saw on January 6th is a lot of these people, when they're interviewed by the media, you can just hear it in the kinds of things they say. They thought they were defending democracy. They really believed they were being called on to be kind of courageous revolutionary actors. That's They went so far down a rabbit hole that they were unable to see themselves as doing something that is a threat to democracy. So they, you know, that that's that kind of twisting of patriotism and logic around a different way of defending the nation, but it's taking an impulse that people might already have and manipulating it. And it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because, you know, as they're complaining that it's being taken away, their freedoms do get taken away when they get carted off to jail uh, for trying to storm the Capitol. So. Yeah, absolutely. We saw this with the truckers protest, too, in Ottawa, where, you know, they're protesting mandates that shut things down and then they're the ones shutting everything down. So there's a lot of irony uh, here that that isn't really fully acknowledged. And there are really two different 
groups here, right? There, there, if, frustrates me that I hear people talk about um, when they talk about members of Congress or they talk about Charlie Kirk or Tucker Carlson, a- any of these bad actors as, you know, they really believe that the election was stolen. They, you know, they believe this. They believe they don't. They don't believe that. It, yeah. This is propaganda and they know they're propagandists. That's very different than the people you're talking about who are going down these rabbit holes, right? Yeah, I mean, I think there are people who are producers of the propaganda. Those are kind of groups and individuals who are bad actors who deliberately seek to manipulate others for their own power or gain or to get elected or they're just taking advantage of things. Then there are the people who make active choices. I don't want to say that they're just passively falling down a rabbit hole. They're still making choices to click on material and they're making choices that take them down that path. But they ultimately come to really believe and and sometimes take tremendous risks, um, you know, in their own behavior or giving up uh, their own freedoms in certain ways, going to prison uh, to to fulfill those, those what they believe is a courageous or revolutionary act. And so people do come to believe that they are really vulnerable to it. Um, and also, you know, the other thing I want to say about that is we often talk about these negative ways that people are drawn in, but a lot of them are drawn in because they want to be a part of something mm-hmm. that is bigger or better than themselves, or they're seeking a sense of meaning. And a lot of the rhetoric and propaganda plays on that, like to restore something or um, embrace something, a brotherhood, um, you know, meaning and purpose in ways that I think are uh, not just about anger or hatred, but also about trying to find some sense of meaning and purpose and engagement in their lives, particularly in a pandemic. Well, yeah, that sense of community building. Um, they're building a community and they're really great at it. And they've developed slick uh, material for it. Um, you surprise the heck out of us. Uh, yeah. I love how I just said heck. Um, <laughs> you did. <laughs> Surprise the heck out of television. The FCC is not going to come get and get it. Yes. Um, but quite surprised with the, the merch. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little about, uh, about the merch, the marketing, how yeah. they're doing this and, yeah. and who they're targeting? Well, I started studying the merchandise, actual branding and commercialization of this propaganda in Germany about 10, 15 years ago. Because in part, what happened in Germany is because of bans on certain kinds of symbols, like you can't show a swastika or even the word for swastika, Hakenkreuz, these really creative ways around those bans started happening and and producing really high quality coded merchandise that made it kind of fun, especially for youth to troll adults, to get around school bans and dress codes, stadium bans, whatever they want to drop the vowels out of a word throws a whole legal discussion into debate about is a word a word if the vowels are removed you know it turns out it's not and so you know they can legally wear that then but that just it created this whole innovative creative culture which eventually spread to the US and then took off in the form of memes and so once memes came on the scene and you could have you didn't just have to wait for a producer to create that iconography or those symbols you could create it yourself and pass it along and modify it. And it became a weaponization of youth culture that ultimately positioned the far right as counterculture to the mainstream. And they were the ones using satire and irony and wit and humor to show that everything was just a joke, you know, in a plausible deniability kind of way um, that against a triggered mainstream that really couldn't get the joke. And so you could embed things like scientific racism or Holocaust denialism in an awful joke as a meme and pass it around amongst your friends as a text among a 15 year old, let's say at school, who then when confronted is like, oh, it's just a joke. Everybody does it. Stop being so, stop overreacting. Right. Yeah. And and that whole phenomenon, I think, really took off and helped dehumanize and create these, um, you know, real hierarchies of, of superiority and inferiority and spread supremacist ideas, both about male supremacism, you know, white supremacism, Western supremacism, anti-immigrant ideas, a whole range of them that have um, really become much more embedded in our, in youth popular culture. Right. And slipping under the radar because we don't know right. to look for these symbols. 
Right. They're coded. Um, their parents don't get it. Teachers don't get it. They show up as emojis. They show up as avatars on your Zoom handle. So sometimes the students recognize it in class, but the faculty or the teachers don't recognize it. And then you have all these different dimensions of what's going on because students recognize a hate symbol that they're seeing online, but the teachers don't catch on. Um, and, and then you constantly, what are you going to do? Keep squashing them, right? It's like a whack-a-mole problem. So by just going at the banning, they just keep evolving the codes, um, turning them into something more so that you get a boogaloo code that starts as a joke among teenagers about a, you know, about a bad breakdancing movie that eventually evolves all the way into full on belief in civil war. It became to mean the second civil war. And I, that's a long explanation of how that happened, but it was a joke created by teenagers that eventually motivated real grown up people to commit murders, um, in the name of this concept of the civil war. Yeah, the the idea of the far right being the the new counterculture for Gen Z is really terrifying. Um, and we mentioned you mentioned briefly at the top of the show about eco fascism, and that all kind of ties into this. That the the motivations of of some of these young people, especially um, young white guys. Um, can start out good, like having an interest in climate change and wanting to be able to do something positive. And that instinct is now being capitalized on by the far right taking them down rabbit holes. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, it's, you know, one of the reasons why I wrote this book that I often spend time talking about called Hate in the Homeland, uh, the new global far right, is to explain really to adults like parents and teachers and others what these kinds of gateways are. And I think of them as gateways because they are places and spaces that open up a lot of times online, but also in real life, like in the mixed martial arts, where some of this recruitment is happening, deliberate recruitment, also highly circulating propaganda and disinformation. And ecofascism is one example of that. The use of it's 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 really a justification for white supremacist extremism based on claims about environmental sustainability. So you can have people encounter that who are really genuinely interested and worried about climate change and environmental sustainability. And then they encounter these ideas that basically say, um, because of climate change, we have to preserve this country for white people and close the borders because there's not enough space. And so it's this embedding, this it, you know, this this creation again of uh, idea of entitlement to the land for white people, which goes all the way back to this idea of blood and soil um, under the Nazis. But this idea that that um, you're blending white supremacist extremism and the environmental sustainability, and that has motivated real terrorists like the El Paso. Um, extremist shooter a couple of years ago. So it's very tricky to disentangle and, and to show, you know, to, to see how someone could just slightly get involved in something and then encounter someone in that space that's introducing them to related ideas that can draw them in. Yeah, I mean, and, and not just like, because in those spaces, that's where the algorithm also sends people off clicking uh, into something that they have no idea. It's 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 really quite fascinating because I've seen it play out with friends and family. So it's it's quite scary. Yeah, you um, absolutely get the algorithms. Also, the recommendation systems, which are algorithms that if somebody else has watched a related video. So some of this can happen just by take, you know, it, it's not actually a human trying to recruit you. It's just because of the way that the salacious content gets further recommended and others have watched a video like that. And then pretty quickly you can get drawn down. And yet it's all very organized and sinister. And because even the convoy, we're finding that there were bot farms and, and things and troll farms that were um, sort of trying to get people to replicate that in the U.S. So is this something that Putin is behind, that Russia is behind, where, like, who's funding all of this? Yeah, I think there is, there's a lot still to learn about foreign interference in this kind of stuff. But we're seeing again and again and again that, that troll farms, whether for state interests or in the case of what's happening with the truck trucker convoys, it appears to be the case from what I've read so far is that um, these were actually just scammers who discovered you could plant links for merchandise on these sites 
and they could really make a profit by selling anti-vax t-shirts or other truckers convoy propaganda. I mean, so you see this intersection of bizarre capitalism, not caring, not having any kind of moral or ethical code about what they're promoting, but it just is turning a profit and making money. And so that you know, and, and so those Facebook has uh, tried or Meta has shut those down when they're discovered, but it already, of course, does a lot of damage and has a lot of people have joined those groups. So so sometimes it's just outsiders trying to turn a profit. Sometimes there's there's some uh, group behind it and sometimes it's just organic. And that's part of what's so tricky here is that our entire prevention system for counter extremism has been built on. Uh, a model in the post 9-11 era, which is about surveillance and monitoring and infiltration of groups, basically, um, and be that have hierarchies that have a chain of command. That's just not the way this works at all, right? This is a much more amorphous network of propaganda that circulates that people find or encounter. And so one of the things I often argue is we have to work on building resilience in the mainstream. We can't just target the fringe um, and expect that we're going to you know, not uh, that we're going to get ourselves out of this basically by just focusing on tamping down the fringe. We have to build a re more resilient, which is less racist mainstream, but also more resilient to propaganda. Well, that that sets up our final question perfectly, um, because part of that resilience is having parents and educators and other people who are in contact with young people understand what you're talking about. You work with um, the Southern Poverty Law Center and Peril at American University to create a free publication. Can you talk about that and some of the uh, some of the things that you're seeing working? Yeah, absolutely. This is my favorite thing to talk about because I will say that even though I do spend my days talking and thinking about kind of dark stuff, um, the reason why I'm in such an optimistic space is because I work with this incredible team of 15 young people in a lab who are dreaming up really interesting ways to intervene and then testing them to see if they work. So in partnership with the Southern Poverty Law Center, we've created a whole series of tools um, for parents, for caregivers, for teachers, mental health counselors. We're doing one now for coaches that help people recognize red flags and warning signs and also know how to intervene more effectively, how to respond um, in ways that don't shame kids and which can drive them further online into spaces where that gets converted to anger um, and, and, and get help from other places. So, you know, parents and, and teachers will have help for any other problem kids might encounter like addiction or depression or you know, eating disorders but they don't know where to go to get help when they start hearing kids espousing conspiracy theories or expressing ideas that they know, you know, are wrong or war warning them that they're encountering something online that's that's nefarious. So this is intended to kind of equip whole communities. And I'll just add to that that um, I'm also really happy that Western State Center created a website for a free website with a reader's guide and discussion guide about my book intended for teachers and parents to kind of use it with imagined scenarios, with a glossary of terms, right? So we're increasingly getting, all of this stuff is free, uh, resources out to communities that can help them be better equipped to kind of seize the reins themselves. I truly appreciate your optimism and optimism once again comes from creating the tools to to combat these sort of things. It's like only through action um, can we actually feel like we're doing something. So I love that you commented on that and that it's young people that are deriving it. Um, Again, so incredibly grateful for, for that generation and for the work that you do. Um, so thank you so much for joining us again. Um, we'll have to have you back because unfortunately, this is going to be a pervasive problem. So yeah, we haven't solved it. So, um, you know, I hope it becomes irrelevant. But until then, I'm happy to come back. Right. Love to Thanks. have you again. Thank you very much. Absolutely. These tools, because if you think about it, you know what to look for um, when it comes to eating disorders, like she right. said. And so I would love to see in like the mass media, like everybody should know what to look for, because uh, I think a lot of times we're just like, oh, not my kids, because right. we like those aren't the values that we have in our household. But yeah, yes, your kids, sometimes your kids. Yeah, sometimes your kids. And I, I think one of the the things that makes people feel exhausted and overwhelmed is that they don't have the information. So mm -hmm. arming ourselves with this knowledge so we can recognize what's happening. We can help our kids. We mm -hmm. can help the, the kids that we work with 
to spot this stuff. And you and I talk about this a lot, Maya. We have to make sure that we remember the numbers we're talking about of the people who've been radicalized, of the mm -hmm. people who are trying to rad radicalize people and take down our democracy. We outnumber them, the yes, pro-democracy coalition, we, yes, we outnumber do. them dramatically. So yes. don't feel like you're in this alone. There are so mm -hmm. many people out there all working in the same direction. Yes, absolutely. We totally are. And don't forget to join the union because there are a bunch of people who are coming together to volunteer and offer their services. If you're asking, what can I do uh, to help out in 2022 with the midterms and everything that's going on, uh, you can join the union and, and offer your services there. So please check that out um, because we're up against what kind of craziness, what happened last week in the <sighs> Republican Party? So much. So much. <laughs> Always so much. Let's roll it. <laughs> We start with the toilet. I'm President Donald Trump. Most believe the president had been flushing documents down his toilet. They can try to raid as many Donald J. Trump supporters as they want. We're just going to keep coming. Breaking news right out of Georgia. We can't even put the, the, the evidence pouring in, the pouring in, Arizona pouring in. Now we have Nancy Pelosi's gazpacho police. The first winner of the Jesse Kelly Show, hottest woman in Congress list, Congresswoman from Colorado, Lauren Boebert. People at MSNBC might not be aware of this, but our country has no domestic Botox production. Homeless people from the people that have spoken want to be homeless. Why won't Joe Biden release the transcript of the call he just had with President Zelensky? When it really hit a moment was when they were chanting F Joe Biden at the New England Patriots. While the Biden administration the media and many in Congress beat the drums of war for Ukraine. There is a far more significant threat, Argentina. I never talk about January 6th because I like my audience. I don't want them to turn me off. Mike Pence, you're not as good as Judas Iscariot because you won't go somewhere and shut your mouth. I think Black Lives Matter as an organization is really evil at its core. I mean, it's a Marxist, an openly Marxist organization. Two of the main leaders are witches. We know that Mar that uh, Karl Marx wanted to destroy the American family. I believe an individual citizen in this country has a right to own a nuclear warhead. But not a delivery device? Oh, all of it, all of it. I think- well, Tim, what about I biological think... weapons? Absolutely, all of it, all of it. Fire! My name's Martin Hyde. I'm running for Congress in Florida 16. What, what the action? <gasps> yeah, you know, <laughs> fuck them. <laughs> I don't, I don't even want to spend time talking about that because there's, there's too much work to be done. There's yeah. too much positive happening, and fuck them. We'll, we'll educate ourselves about the tactics, but. What I really can't, you mentioned the union before, Maya, this this is so important because you yeah. and I hear from people all the time who mm -hmm. are asking, what can we do? Mm -hmm. So so what you can do is join the union. It's a, it is a single issue organization, pro-democracy. It's a pro-democracy it. co coalition <laughs> that will match up individuals with organizations mm -hmm. who are in this pro-democracy fight with us and they need people to help do the work. So um, go to jointheunion.us mm -hmm. and you can sign up there. Um, everybody has skills and talents and energy that we can be putting into saving the democracy. So if, um, if you are feeling like uh, you're paralyzed, and like it's overwhelming. You don't need to feel that way because there are actual things that you can be doing and the union um, will will give you the means to be able to do that. And taking action feels a lot yeah. better than uh, just feeling like things are out of control because they are within your control. They are. Nobody wants to sit on the sidelines of a game. That's not where you want to be. You don't want to sit on the bench. You're like, no, I've got these skills. Put them to use um, and, and come back next week because we'll be back next week and come back tomorrow because uh, the breakdown's back with Tara Setmayer and Rick Walton, uh, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. They'll be joined by John Seifer. Um, so we'll see you next week.
Good night. Yep. It's going to be a great show.